So a very big Winnipeg Real to Real Film Festival. Welcome to Marta Fuchs. She is one of the co-producers of the film. And we're going to presume if you're watching this that you've already seen the film. So just keep that in mind. There'll be spoilers as we go ahead and, uh, and look at this. And uh, she's a co-producer of the Soldier's Uniform. And her father was rescued by Zoltan, which is an amazing story. Marta, welcome to the festival. Thank you for having me. Yeah, great, great to have you. So the story of your father, the story of Zoltan is just incredible. It was amazing to watch. Uh, what did your father say about Zoltan? What, what kind of man was he? How did he uh, come across to him? Well, it was interesting that I never heard the story until I was 37 years old. We had talked about the Holocaust, sort of general outlines, but my father never even considered himself a survivor because he said, your mother who survived Auschwitz is the survivor. I was just five years in forced labor. Uh, and then in preparation for an educational television program, our family was going to be interviewed. Um, I helped my parents prepare for it. And suddenly my dad says, you know, there's something I want to tell you about, but I'm so ashamed that I can't remember his name. And he proceeds to tell me this remarkable story of rescue. But he's shaking his head. He goes, I can't forgive myself for not remembering the name. I go, dad, it was, this is back in the eighties. I said, dad, it was 40 years ago. He goes, no, there's no excuse. This man saved my life and the life of my, you know, compatriot. So I said, I'll make you a deal. If you talk about this during the interview, I will help you write letters, you know, pre-internet dates, of course. Mm -hmm. And we will write to all the people you are still in contact with uh, who were in your labor battalion and they'll write letters to people anyway. And then I said, in exchange for documenting this testimony and when we get his name, we need to send it into Yad Vashem. Mm -hmm. We need to have this person honored as a righteous Gentile. Mm -hmm. So months go by and one night he calls me and says, uh, his name is Sultan Kubini. And he was thrilled that I began to write about uh, the story. I started, I mean, this was in 1987. It took several years for Yad Vashem to get around in their scheduling to, um, read the, hit my dad's testimony and the testimony of one of his friends in the labor camp who's featured in the film, Isaac Goodman. Uh, for those of you who saw the film, you'll recall he was uh, keeping kosher the entire five years and was very weak and, you know, wouldn't eat much except bread and jam and potatoes. So Kubinyi, who was with them for the last year of the war, made him the camp rabbi. And he, instead of forcing him to go out to work in the fields, he would uh, have the assignment of preparing a sermon every week. Um, for the men, and he would tell it in Hungarian. He was a very learned man, both in uh, just general knowledge and in the Bible and Jewish tradition. Uh, so then I unearthed the family. Um, my father knew that he had a wife, uh, Zoltan had a wife and child living in Budapest. I was hoping that I could find them by the time I found them. Uh, the, his wife had passed away, um, but then I talked with the son, met him, you'll in the film, you'll recall the commemoration we did in my hometown in Tokai. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just so moving to meet him, especially since I have this wonderful father for nearly 50 years of my life. Whereas Marton was six months old when his father went off to war, never mm. to return again, uh, dying of typhus a year in, after uh, being taken into captivity by the 
liberating Russian army. So I put my father and Marton in touch. So they corresponded for quite some time. And then I corresponded also and we would, with his wife and we would visit them in Hungary. And then uh, Marton and his wife passed away. And in 2011, the summer of 2011, when it was going to be my father's 100th birthday, he died at age 89 in 2000. I, in honor of that, wanted to write a book. And so I also wanted my kids and my brother and his kids to meet the rescuers family. So we went back to Hungary and met for the first time the grandson and reunited with one of the great granddaughters. And in the film, you saw them being interviewed. Mm -hmm. And it, they feel like extended family. It's just so wonderful. So it brings me to the reason that I was thrilled to write the book. And then I'll tell you how the film happened, which is not just to document what happened, the remarkable compassion and heroism of Sultan Kupini. But how what happened continues to reverberate down through the generations to today, both in my family and in the rescuers family. And, you know, as a psychotherapist, we know that the past is never in the past and it lives within us. And, you know, with such a overwhelmingly horrible, a sorrowful background as a member of the generation that wasn't supposed to be born, I feel a sense of responsibility to document what happened and also to talk about the multi-generational impact uh, in the hopes that it might help other families as well, not necessarily with the Holocaust as their background, but Sadly, man's inhumanity to man has run rampant through the ages. Uh, so the rippling effects of the past, I think is really important to, to document and talk about. Now, Gary Kent got involved in this project as well. What, yeah, what's the connection? Well, He's fantastic in this film. I just love it. Yeah. yeah, so totally unexpectedly. So as I mentioned to you, I had lived in the Bay Area for over 40 years. I moved down to Santa Monica a few years ago because the ocean and my daughter were calling mm -hmm. and people were teasing me that, oh, you're in the land of filmmaking, you know, maybe you'll end up making a film because for over 30 years, I've spoken about this story in schools and in churches, interfaith programs, Holocaust commemoration, mm. Rotary clubs, whatever. And whenever I speak, people say, oh, it's so cinematic. So friends were teasing me, now that you're down in the LA area, maybe a film will come about. Sure enough, a couple years after I get here, I get out of the blue an email from Australia from Gary Kent. Mm -hmm. He says he's, in a, he's an archeologist and a Seventh-day Adventist minister. Mm -hmm. Sultan Kubinyi was a devout Seventh-day uh, Adventist and a conscientious objector who didn't wear a gun in his holster. And Gary said, I came across an article of yours Turned out it was the first article I wrote back in the 90s when I was working on my first book. And he said, I hear that you have a book that's come out since then. How can I get a hold of it? So I give him the info. After reading it, he says, you know, I have a television series called The Incredible Journey. And he travels around the globe filming on location incredible stories many of them related to his uh, faith. And essentially the television series is his worldwide ministry. The program um, series gets broadcast directly in Australia and New Zealand, and then you know through his website and YouTube around the globe. Mm -hmm. So 
he said, next time I'm in Los Angeles, if you're game, let's meet and talk about it. And I go, oh, yeah, you know, I would start following him and he's like gallivanting around the world. And I'm going, oh, yeah, whenever that'll happen. Sure enough, he had a layover. So we meet. He goes, where should we film? I said, well, the events took place in the Bryansk forest in the Ukraine, but no, nothing else is there except all the trees. How about we film in my hometown, Tokai, where mm -hmm. there's still a handful of my childhood friends, uh, Jewish friends and other friends, and where my father was born. And because of my father's testimony, Zoltan Kubini was honored as a righteous among the nation. Mm -hmm. And I could pull together my friends and whatever, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, for the reenactment. So we spent a year preparing. Gary wrote a beautiful script. Yeah, it's very well done. Beautiful. He, I was so moved that he really captured the heart of the story mm -hmm. in the context of the decimation of in that community the and in Europe in general where two thirds of European jury was wiped out. Mm -hmm. But in my hometown, about a quarter of the town of 5,000 before the war were Jews and they represented 90% of the shopkeepers and leaders of the community. Now there's a handful left. Um, so he, being a man of faith, and like Kubanyi, respecting the faith of the Jewish men under his command, who were all from the countryside of Hungary, and so they were observant Orthodox Jews, as opposed to many of the Hungarian Jews in Budapest and other large cities who are much more assimilated and, you know, are are not as, as you know, um, observant. And he really wanted to capture some of the flavor of the remnants of the Jewish community. So the davening, the praying that he uh, portrayed in the little study hall next to the big synagogue uh, was our childhood friend, uh, Miklos, uh, as she faced the film on the right and my brother on the left. And it was really moving that in the midst of, you know, all this talk of decimation, you know, here are these two childhood friends, you know, continuing their uh, practicing their faith. Mm. What did you find was most rewarding about learning about Zoltan and about his connection to your father. What stands out for you as, as the most impactful part of that relationship? Well, just how lucky I have been to have had such a wonderful father who in therapy sessions with my clients, I sort of lend his kindness and goodness to people who didn't experience that. Mm -hmm. And the only reason my father is alive is because of Sultan Kubini. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, he got written orders mm -hmm. from the Nazis, written orders to march the men to a concentration camp to be liquidated since they were no longer needed for the war effort as Germany was losing the war and Hungary being allied with Nazi Germany. And he defied those orders and told the men. Uh, and then at one point when, you know, the, he's marching them into, the, into Hungary, all the way from the Ukraine, um, some neighbors uh, at a farmhouse they were being housed at in exchange for working the fields, could be arranged that with the owners, some military police show up. And, you know, we depicted that, that, you know, 
Kubinyi's uh, fellow soldiers got them nice and drunk after dinner. Mm. And when they fell asleep, Kubinyi got roused the men up and said, you know, run. Mm -hmm. And they mm -hmm. escaped. Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, to have such an amazing father is pretty unusual, it seems to me. Um, and he was like everybody's father and grandfather growing up. He was their link to the old world. He was a man of compassion and integrity and a leader in the Jewish community. Um, people will still today at the temple I was raised at, where my dad was a leader, people today still say, when we have disagreements, we always say, what would Morton say? <laughs> I mean, you know, we've all heard what would Jesus say? And it's just so wonderful that people, you know, continue to hold him within himself. So I have Zoltan Kubini to thank for him. And then my children, um, you know, they chime in in the book and I end the book with what my daughter says. If it weren't for Kubini, I, my dad wouldn't have been in the world. I wouldn't have been born and my daughter wouldn't have been born. And she's hoping to have kids and mm. those kids wouldn't have been born. True. So, you know, the difference that one man can, one person can make against great odds. Uh, and when I speak about the story in schools, oftentimes during uh, a theme about decision-making, especially moral decision-making, you know, I suggest to the students that we each can make a difference in everyday life. We hopefully don't, we'll never find ourselves in those circumstances where Kubinyi made that choice to save his labor battalion. But you can make a difference Every day there are choice points. And so to me, the story of Zoltan Kubinyi is both restorative mm -hmm. against the backdrop of all the horror um, and so inspirational that we can rise to an occasion, big and small, to, to make a difference. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Marta, for your, your kind words and for sharing your story and for, for making the film. And uh, people can buy your book, uh, The Legacy of Rescue, A Daughter's Tribute. And that's available on Amazon, both in paperback, also on Kindle. And uh, also on my it. website, if you want me to what, sign yeah, it. Yeah, what, what, what is your website? Why don't you give that up? The website is just martafuchsfuchs.com. Okay, very good. We'll put a link and up on the site. You can go there to see the film also, just okay. a direct to the film. That's awesome. Marta, thanks very, very much. And uh, many blessings to you. And uh, it, you. yeah, and a big thanks to, to Gary Kent as well from the other. Just cool that he got involved in making it. So, yeah. And, uh, and thank you for Wonderful. sharing your story. Thank you.